morning, everybody. Um, let me just see a show of hands, just for context setting. How many of you have been to the Exploratorium? Wow, that's, that, that, that's kind of awesome. That's cool. All right, how many of you have been to the new Exploratorium? All right, all right, that's good. Okay, so we moved in 2013. It was, it was a big relocation, big project. And um, the Exploratorium, I don't really need to explain this. It seems like a lot of you know. But it's a museum of science, art, and human perception. Those three words are actually quite important to us. It was founded in 1969 by the physicist Frank Oppenheimer, brother of J. Robert Oppenheimer of the Manhattan Project. Frank also worked on the Manhattan Project and was blacklisted, actually, in the 50s. And as a result of that journey, kind of invented a new form of education that was much more hands-on, because he couldn't teach in universities, I guess. Um, the Export Time is a social place. It's a social place for children and adults. These are our evening events on Thursday evenings where you have to be over 18 to attend. We started a lot being focused around physics and perception, but very quickly the biological sciences actually got added to that. This is our biological sciences um, gallery, and that, that, that light sculpture by Rafael Lozano Hammer is actually driven by a heartbeat. We've also added more and more focus on the social sciences. This is our science of sharing exhibition that Dacker was actually an advisor for. And it really sort of anchors our West Gallery, which is what we, about what we call human phenomena. So more than just a museum, more than just a social place to examine exhibits, we also are a place that is, we call ourselves a learning laboratory. We invent new learning tools. And a big part of what we do is offer professional development for educators, including formal educators. This is a website for our Teachers Institute. And we offer these little science snacks, which are small versions of our exhibits. We also conduct research on learning in an informal setting. This is about getting people to ask what we call juicy questions around exhibits. But most importantly, a great amount of the research that we do is practitioner research. It's designing those learning tools. It's artists, scientists, engineers, carpenters. It's the craft research of figuring out what engages people, what produces wonder, what produces awe. And so our shop is actually right next to the floor. There's just a low wall separating it. And we really celebrate this idea that we're a laboratory for new learning designs. So I've used the word informal science education. And this is a graph that, that is kind of interesting to look at. The x-axis is lifelong. It's all the years of a life. The y-axis is the 16 waking hours in a day. And the orange color is the number of hours spent in formal schooling. The great big blue area beyond that is all the area that is potential for informal learning. So it's what happens at the kitchen table, what happens on the way to school, what happens after school, and what happens in trips to museums. So that's what we really concentrate on, is learning that can happen naturally in a, in a setting where there isn't a requirement to be learning, where it's authentic, natural curiosity. So in preparing for this talk, I had a lot of conversations with my colleagues about awe, and we had great conversations about this. But the, the, the focus of the conversation kept on switching to wonder. And it's interesting. I think the word awe, for some reason, at the Exploratorium isn't quite right for what we do. And I think wonder winds up, winds up being a better word to talk about what it is that we really try to cultivate. I think they're closely related. They're both complex emotions. I mean, they're very closely related, but I'm going to talk primarily about wonder and then offer some possibilities about what might be the same and what might be the different about the two. So I boiled down to six elements of wonder, which is kind of what I'll go through in the rest of the talk. And, but it was a lot of work getting to six. I started with about 12, and boiling them down, it shows me how complex, how it's individual, it's perceptual, it's cognitive, it's emotional, it's social. It works at many different levels. And um, what I'm going to do for this talk is I'm going to use exhibits and programs about light as the focus. So you've already done a lot with sound. I'm going to focus on light, because that, too, has a history and a relationship to the experience of awe. So everything I'm going to show you has something to do with light. In this case, it's light shining through moving water, which is one of our exhibits. So, but founded from the start was this idea that in order to investigate the physical world, you're doing it through perception, and obviously our visual sense is a huge part of that. 
So the first element that I'm going to talk about is kind of, it's kind of almost behavioral. It's engagement. Are you focused on it? Are you leaning into the experience? Are you doing it voluntarily? Natural curiosity. And this is kind of the number one criteria because people don't stay at exhibits if they're not sticky. And people don't stay with experiences if they aren't inherently interesting. So this quality, the quality on those faces and the quality of engagement and interest is actually what we try to cultivate. We also study it with empirical studies. We actually had a project called Going Ape, and the Ape stands for Active Prolonged Engagement. So yes, people can be engaged with their cell phones, but we're looking for physically active and prolonged engagement, and that's what we see and study at exhibits a great deal. We found it to be pretty universal. We do projects all over the world. We help other places develop museums. We help train teachers from around the world. This was a series of tinkering programs we did in Saudi Arabia. And we also have an institute that we collaborate with, which is called Science for Monks. And these are the Dalai Lama's monks who are actually coming to the Exploratorium, and then we're also going to Dharamsala. These are Tibetan monks in, in exile. And we're actually training them inquiry-based science. Key to the engagement is sensory, sensory richness and aesthetic richness. It's kind of the natural use of our full sensory potential. This is an exhibit from the early Exploratorium. And part of what we do is we try to refine the senses and give very specific sensual, sensory experiences that you wouldn't necessarily experience in the general world, although it turns out there are plenty of them available there. This is actually a, an exhibit called Mood Color, and it changes color, and you get to experience different emotions with your head in this ball of color there. <laughs> But it's not just sensory richness, it's also aesthetic richness. It's looking for patterns, patterns that scientists might look for in looking at how light is refracted and bent, and more complex patterns, sort of emergent complex patterns at the edge of chaos. And patterns in motion. We're tuned to respond to motion. If I do something suddenly very active, your, kind of, your sensory system wakes up. And that's the same with many of our exhibits. And so, in fact, many of our exhibits, the whole point is to look at something in motion and to sort of fall in love with patterns in motion. Our exhibits are often created by artists. This is that piece that I mentioned earlier by Rafael Lozano Hemmer. And its, it's mechanism is light, but it's connecting humans with this larger sculpture. Already you get a little bit of that element of awe there. But again, it's the patterns. It's the patterns that artists are so good at curating and creating. And more broadly, our sensory experiences are not just visual, it's embodied. Many of our exhibits are gross motor, full body experiences. And one, one, the way that one educator once put it is that we try to play the whole human sensory instrument. We try to engage the full range of senses and physical sort of kinesthetic awareness that people have naturally. So I think we've already heard about size and I could say spectacle as an element of, of awe and of wonder, potentially. Many things that we think are wonderful kind of make us stand back and look at the whole world. And we try to create, often working with artists, pieces that also have a, just by virtue of scale and immersivity, have a kind of wondrous spectacle quality. This is a piece by the Japanese artist Fujiko Nakaya, where this bridge at the outdoor exploratorium just sort of suddenly erupts in this, in this, in this cloud of fog. Here's a kind of immersive sense of that. This is a piece I understand we're going to be hearing probably about Leo Villarreal a little bit later on. And this is a much smaller piece than what you'll be hearing about later on. It's a buckyball. But again, it's, sh it's sheer scale on our site. Is, it turns out to be an important element. And how it changes as the light dims and as we move into nighttime. So this combination of light and spectacle are very important to many artists. And this is from our opening, our opening night. At the Exploratorium, we actually worked with this group called Digital, uh, Digital Obscura, and they projected onto the front facade of our building this wonderful light show 
that really kind of like stopped traffic and we had huge crowds on the Embarcadero. The city of San Francisco wasn't so happy about it, but. <laughs> Moving from the sensory richness to the spectacle, which are very sort of almost environmental elements, I want to move a little bit sort of into the mind a little bit more and into a sense of inquiry. I joke that sometimes the Exploratorium should be understood as a temple, a high temple for inquiry. That's, that, that's our highest value. Is it working? Is it provoking inquiry-based learning? And what does that mean? It means that you're actually starting to ask questions, formulate your own questions, creating experiments, and prompting some kind of investigation. This is again from some workshops that we did with, with, with the Tibetan monks. And these are exercises just about sort of the reason for the seasons. But if you can give people the right tools, then the questions naturally occur. The questions about, well, wait, what is, why is it this way? What would happen if, we love that question, what happens if? We're more interested, frankly, in questions, provoking questions, than we are in creating and hearing answers. This is something, you mentioned the awe walk. We actually have something that was created by Bob Miller, who's sort of worked with us for many years, and that was actually called the light walk. And it really is kind of a noticing walk. And the whole point of this is to just go out, and this, this ties into that idea of everyday wonder. When you go out on break, if the sun is shining, I want you to look at the patterns of light that get filtered through the trees. And if you can, bring a piece of paper and look at the shape of those little splotches of light. It turns out that even though the holes in the leaves are not circles, every single one of the spots on your piece of paper is a circle. So it's a very surprising thing about light. And you kind of go, well, what's going on? Why is that? So here's another example of that. The spaces between this person's fingers are not circles, but the shapes actually on the piece of paper are circles. It turns out that a small enough opening, every single one of those small enough openings is working like a little camera obscura. And it's actually helping you see an image of the sun. Every one of those circles is an image of the sun. Oh. Wow. So that little experience, taking something that we take for granted, like sunlight coming through a tree, can provoke a sense of wonder. I heard a little bit of that. There was a little bit of like, oh, right? That was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it? You can see that even more clearly when there's an eclipse. There's one coming next summer to North America when you can actually see that the moon, every single one of those splotches of light actually has a little shadow of the moon cast over it. So we've taken this light walk from the outside and we've turned it into an exhibit on the inside, but we also use it for our teacher training programs, our teacher professional development programs, because it turns out the most important thing that we do at our teacher institute and our institute for inquiry is we try to help teachers remember what it felt like to be curious themselves. Remember what it felt like not to have the answers, to actually wonder without knowing what the answers were. And it turns out light is a great subject for that because light has a lot of puzzles to it that are not immediately obvious. One element, potentially in inquiry, but also in other things, is an element that also Dacker mentioned is sort of surprise. Like, whoa, I didn't expect that. Something new being uncovered out of something that you maybe take for granted. So that's this experience here again, where you see sort of square shapes make round, or actually help you see images of the sun. Also, take a look at this for a moment here. I hope it works. You, are you seeing things moving there? Yeah. So what's going on there? That provokes curiosity. Optical illusions are a wonderful window into our perceptual, cognitive, neurological apparatus. Many of them that we still don't understand, but they're windows into understanding how our brain works. Fun exhibits that are playful, that allow people to sort of imagine defying gravity. Or other experiences with teachers that are just plain old silly, that break the norm. <laughs> that again are about light, but are also about wandering around the world in a new way. So the last of these elements that I want to highlight is actually one that, that is implied in many exploratory exhibits. We don't necessarily make the connections for people, but implied in it, especially when you're dealing with light, is immediately something interesting about self 
in the world and in the universe. So I'm going to start at the very human scale. This is a high-speed camera that captures an image of a drop of water, but it also allows the visitor to put themselves in this exhibit and to see themselves back in that drop of water upside down through a lensing effect. So this little subtle effort, effect of mirroring, of every exhibit being a mirror, we, we once joked that we should do an exhibition on the science of narcissism. Because, <laughs> because everybody wants to see themselves back in the world. But I think that's an element of wonder, is like, oh, wow, that's me, but in a new way. This is our giant parabolic mirror that has some really pretty cool effects. But I think it gets bigger, too. I think through seeing and through light, through the combination of just optics and visual perception and the cultural of visual images, you start to think about yourself in the world. You start to think about your brain. How does your brain work? But you also think about yourself in culture. It's an image of Times Square. I think it's the only image of non-exploratorium stuff that I've got in there. So it helps you place yourself in a larger visual world. It also connects you to astronomical events. Most of the light we see is from that distant star. And in fact, space is filled with images of the sun. You just need something like a small little hole to get rid of all the extra ones so that you can see that there are lots of little images of the sun that are surrounding you. Light also takes you down to the nanoscale and lower than that. This is an exhibit about watch water freeze where polarized filters help you see the, the way that the light is bent by the crystal shapes of the freezing water. So you put these together, and light itself connects you inside your head, out into culture, above into the stars, down into chemistry. And you can go even further. It connects you to the beginning of time with the cosmic background radiation, which was actually a form of light that reached our planet that allowed us to talk about the Big Bang. And it also goes down to the, where does light come from? It's a subatomic event. So the simple thing that we take for granted, if you open it up a little bit, if you start wondering a little bit more and noticing a little bit more, it connects you to the universe, big and small. So in conclusion, back to awe and wonder. I've mostly talked about wonder. I think they're connected, but I think they're slightly different. And I put it here on this chart, I think the spectacle and the cosmology sides of wonder are kind of a little bit more on the awe side. I think inquiry, which is more active, which is more kind of asking the questions, is a little bit more on the wonder side. I was thinking about this talk and sort of thinking about the difference between the leaning back of awe like this, which is kind of receptive and sort of where you're humbled in the face of the universe, and the kind of leaning in of inquiry and that those two are very close, but they're slightly different in terms of the, the way that they prompt engagement. To end, I'm gonna just end with a movie. We love working with artists. This was something that was actually created, which is in our collection. And it was a movie that was made quite a while ago, long before computers. But it's a wonderful example of kind of both the small scale and the intimacy and the humor that can happen around thinking about light. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.